there are two stories here uh, about two tamas. One is the story which I think is uh, perhaps, well, I don't know which is better known. I mean, I think you know both of them. Uh, although the one which is also a Parshat Shavua, of course, is the one that you probably know better because one reads it once a year. Uh, but I want to start, Dafka, with the other one where we all know, at least every Israeli knows, the names concerned, which are of Amnon and Tamar, that's the Hebrew name for a pansy, the beautiful flower, the two colored flowers, sometimes even more colors, right? And what I'm going to do is just read it aloud and until the texts come. Okay. I want to start with the first one and listen carefully and I'll make some comments as I go, right? Okay? Because then we're going to compare, then we're going to contrast. Okay. I'm starting with Shmuel Bet, right? And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. So we know that there are two sons of David here, right? In other words, if Tamar is the sister of one, she is also the sister of the other. No, it doesn't say so, right? They're different mothers, but the same father, okay? And Amnon was so distressed that he felt sick because of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed hard to Amnon to do anything to, unto her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Yonadab, the son of Shemer, David's brother. In other words, Yonadav was the cousin, right? And Yonadav was a very subtle man. The translation here is interesting. If you look at the Hebrew, it's Ish Chacham Mo'od. Okay? Uh, interesting. Subtle is a little bit different from Chacham, right? Wise, clever. Uh, and he said unto him, why, O son of the king, art thou thus becoming art thou thus becoming leaner from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? In other words, this lovesick Amnon is not eating right. He's pining away uh, in the good old tradition of lovers, right? Uh, uh, he's pining away for Tamar. Right? Uh, and Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Yonadav said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and feign thyself sick, pretend to be sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, Let my sister Tamar come, I pray thee, and give me bread to eat, and dress the food in my sight, that I may see it, and eat it at her hand. Right? So this is Yonadav's advice. Right? He doesn't quite say what else. Does he think that, that Tamar will make, if Tamar makes the food and Amnon eats it, then Amnon will immediately feel better because he'll be eating? Or is there some ulterior motive? Notice that there's no ulterior motive mentioned here. Just she should come and she should prepare the food and you feel, you'll feed, you'll eat it, right? So Amnon lay down and feigned himself sick. Now we've just been told that he was sick, but now he just pretends to be sick. And when the king came, it was come to see him, and his father comes to see him. In other words, he's so sick that his father, the king, comes to see him. Then when his father comes, uh, Amnon said unto the king, Let my sister Tamar come, I pray thee, and make me a couple of cakes in my sight, that I may eat at her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him food. Uh, so Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was lying down. And she took dough and kneaded it, and made cakes in his sight, and did bake the cakes. Right? Tamar, very obedient, right? She does what she's told. Right? Uh, and she took the pan and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. 
And Amnon said, Have out all men from me. And they went out every man from him. And Amnon said unto Tamar, Bring the food into the chamber, that I may eat of thy hand. And Tamar, the innocent, right, takes the cakes, took the cakes which she had made, and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. And when she had brought them near unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come lie with me, my sister. And so it's interesting, it says, my sister. It doesn't say Tamar, right? The relationship is stressed as if, uh, right, to stress also the incestuous element here, the, the author wants to stress the incestuous element. And she answered him, Name my brother. Do not force me. So notice that there are three things she now mentions. For no such thing ought to be done in Israel. This is just against the law, right? This, this isn't done. Do not thou this wanton deed. And then the second uh, reason is, and I... Whither shall I carry my shame? You'll be harming me. What will I do? I'll be disgraced. I'll be shamed, right? My honor will be actually tainted. And as for thee, thou wilt be as one of the base men in Israel, right? Naval, okay? Connecting mm -hmm. So there are three reasons. The law, me, and you. Each of these will be affected if you carry out this deed. So what does she suggest instead? Now therefore I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. In other words, she assumes that if Amnon asks for her hand in marriage, David will agree to it. Right? But he doesn't listen to her. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. So he rapes her, in effect, right? He forced her. Then comes an interesting Voltfass, the change, which, by the way, many psychologists have pointed to, and perhaps some of us also have encountered, how somebody who lusts after someone... Yeah, when they then get the fulfillment of their lust, immediately that lust turns to um, hate, hatred really, even the sense of how could I have loved this creature? Shakespeare does this wonderfully in Midsummer Night's Dream, by the way. It's an excellent, uh, excellent example, right? Then Amnon hated her with exceeding great hatred, right? In other words, from pining for love for her, now with exceeding great ken, sin agdolam od. For the hatred wherewith he hatred her, hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, and in Hebrew this is even curter than it is in English, arise, be gone, right? Kumi lechi. That's it. He just dismisses her, right? And she said unto him, Not so, because this great wrong in putting me forth is worse than the other thou didst unto me. The public shame, which was exactly what she'd spoken about, this is even worse. Everybody will know what's happened to me, right? But he would not hearken unto her. Then he called his servant that ministered unto him and said, again, I want you to look at the Hebrew here, right, Yudzain, Shilkuna et Zot mi alai. Yes. I mean, the English is much gentler, right, or put now this woman out from me. But et Zot, right, is the curtness there, the way it's almost like an object, the objectification of, of Tamar there, Shilhuna Zot, okay, yeah, right. Um, and bolt the door after her, right? Just make sure she doesn't get back in again. 
Now, and by the way, we've had the only speech, the only time Tamar actually speaks was in that speech where she appeals to Amnon, right? That's all she has to say. What we now hear is, however, she does give voice, she does vent her grief in some way, right? She enacts, she acts out what the, the terrible, the terrible impact that, uh, I mean, what she's feeling as a result of this. Now, she had a garment of many colors upon her, for with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparelled. In other words, it, it was like a uniform. Everybody knew which of the king's daughters were virgins by this coat of many colors, right? Remember Joseph as well, right? Um, and his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her. Now, what does Tamar do? She actually performs a public act of mourning, right? She, there's an act of self-abasement here. She puts ashes on her head and rent her garment of many colors. She tears to pieces this garment of many colors, the symbol of virginity, which is no longer appropriate. And she laid her hand on her head and she went her way crying aloud as she went. Right? Uh, zaka is the uh, the zaka is the Hebrew, right? Uh, we don't hear how the public responds. Rather interesting. One of the king's daughters, right, uh, walking in the city, one <laughs> screaming, right? Um, extraordinary image here, where we I think are called upon to imagine how people would respond, because after all, she's doing this publicly, right? Uh, and Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother yeah. been with thee? But now, now what does he tell her? Yeah. But now, hold thy peace, my sister. Yeah. Keep quiet. Yeah. Be silent. Don't talk about it. He is thy brother. Take not this thing to heart. Right? Tashiti et liber vel davar haze vetechev akuti hachrishi hachrishi. Don't say anything. There's that, you know, keep it, don't, don't talk about it. Just keep quiet. Right? What I was talking about before, the women who don't speak out, right? Why? Because he's your brother. You know, and this is, would be putting him to shame as well. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. And the question is where, how do, how do we respond to that? It, we'll, we'll come to that later. Uh, but when King David heard of all these things, no, what did he do? He was very wroth. Doesn't do anything, right? We are fair law, ma'od. Okay. He was very angry, but that's it. Doesn't do anything. And Absalom spoke unto Amnon, neither good nor bad. Absalom doesn't say anything, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. Now he hates him, but he doesn't say a word, right? Only after two full years, Absalom had sheep shearers in Baal Chasor, which is beside Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold now, thy servant hath sheep shearers. Let the king, I pray thee, and his servants go with thy servant. And the king said to Absalom, Nay, my son, let us not all go, lest we be burdensome unto thee. And he pressed him, however, he, albeit he would not go, but blessed him. Then said Absalom, If not, I pray thee, let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said unto him, Why should he go with thee? But Absalom pressed him, and he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. 
And Absalom commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, Smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not, have not I commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. Chisku Okay. Now, this is a trick, right? It's a trick. It's a trick that's using food or wine. We have other examples in Genesis of tricks being played with food, right? Uh, okay, right. We have... Okay. Uh, Jacob, Esau, right? Somebody wants some venison and so satisfy the, the lust, if you like, of the person and trick him into doing something or enabling you, in this case, to do something. But notice that this revenge act is conceived of as something heroic. Okay? It's a villainous act. Right? First you get him drunk, first you wait two years. Okay, that's the first thing. Right? Then you get the man drunk, and then you have your people kill him. It's a revenge murder. Okay. Sort of an eye for an eye. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man got him up upon his mule and, fl and fled. And it came to pass, while they were in the way, that the tidings came to David, saying, Absalom has slain all the king's sons, and there is not one of them left. Of course, this was just a rumor. It's a false rumor, right? Now, notice how the king, well, king responds here. Rent his garments, just as Tamar rends her garments, right? Lay on the earth, again, that prostration of grief and his all his servants stood by with their clothes rent and Yonadav now you remember Yonadav from earlier on right the son of Shimea David's brother answered and said let not my lord suppose that they have killed all the young men the king's sons for Amnon only is dead for by the appointment of Absalom, this has been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. In other words, Absalom has been planning this ever since he raped Tamar. Right? And this is, of course, the first time that David learns about the rape of Tamar. And remember that Absalom was David's favorite son as well, right? Okay? Um, now, therefore, let not my lord the king take the thing to his heart. What does that remind you of? Let not the king take things to his heart. Right? That's what Absalom told Tamar. You know, don't, don't take it to heart, right? To think that all the king's sons are dead, for Amnon only is dead, right? Okay, so you don't have to grieve quite as much if it's just one of your sons, right? There's a kind of parallel here to Absalom's calming Tamar down by saying, okay, just keep quiet, right? Don't talk about it, just accept it. And Yonadab saying to David, okay, it's not so terrible, it's not all your sons, it's just one of them. And he is the one who raped your daughter. Okay, I saw a hand up, yes. Well, word gets around about these things, right? Okay. How did we get to hear about Sabra and Shatila? I mean, you can't keep those things, but somebody, somebody gets out and reports it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, look, David must have known about Tamar. She wanders in, I mean, she wanders around the city, you know. But someone must have told him. Uh, we, don't, we don't hear that he was told. We don't hear how he responds. We, the relevant thing there is how Absalom responds. And then we have the parallel afterwards. 
the ironic parallel of Yonadab saying exactly the same thing to David, you know, uh, that uh, that Absalom had said to Tamar, you know, okay, just keep one. Not so terrible. It's just your virginity, if you like. But the implication, of course, that the brother will then, uh, uh, not the implication, he will avenge his sister, right? Okay, so that's one story, and we'll come back with it. What we, what is interesting here? What about Tamar? Uh, she disappears. We have no idea. What about Tamar? No, we don't know. We just don't know. Okay. Right. Yes. We don't hear of her. We don't know. Absolutely. No, with Dina, of course, the I was thinking of, of bringing the Dina story, but it's too much. Because if you look at the chapter which deals with, the, with Dina in Genesis, she is objectified all the time. It's, her name is, hard, is not mentioned. Right? Just look carefully at that chapter. Right? And after it says, Dina went down, you know, to the, to, to the city. After that, it's she, 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 she. As if really uh, objectification. But we'll come back to tomorrow in a moment, I hope, if we have enough time left. Let's look, yes. Yes, yes, yes. He will not withhold me for absolutely, absolutely. Well, apparently, right? That's, uh, she was a half sister. She was a half sister. Same father, different mothers, different different mothers, right? Yeah, but if it's I think we save the questions for the end because we don't yeah, have okay. time with everybody. So let's has. look. Let's look at now at, at uh, because I do want to do the comparisons and contrasts if we can. Now, so here what we had was a trick story, right? Trickery. Amnon tricks Tamar, and then Absalom tricks Amnon. Right? Classical trick story. Okay. And now we have another trick story in the story of um, Tamar and Huda. And it came to pass at that time that Huda went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adalamite whose name was Kira. And, the, and Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in unto her. And she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. And she conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. And she yet again bore a son and called his name Shelah. And he was at Chazib, and she bore him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord. Okay? He was wicked. And the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her, and raise up seed to thy brother. And, okay. and Onan knew that the seed would not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground lest he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he slew him also. Now twice it's stressed that what both Ur and Onan did, we don't exactly know what Ur's wickedness was, right, but whatever he did, it was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and in Onan's case, we know exactly what he did, and it's also wicked in the sight of the Lord, and in both cases, God kills them. Right? Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, 
remain a widow in thy father's house, in other words, go back to your father's house till Shelach, my son, be grown up, which is all right, right? In other words, he's too young as yet to be married to you, so wait. But of course, it's an injustice to send her back to her father's house, right? But why does he do it? Judah says to himself, lest he also die like his brethren. In other words, he thinks that Tamar is the cause of the son's death. We know from the text that it's their wickedness that, is, uh, that has brought down this punishment from God. But he's blaming her. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house, which means that she is actually a kind of, um, she's in no man's land. She should be I, either, she has no status. She has no status at all, right? She has no property, nothing. She should stay in Yehuda's household, which is where she actually belongs until she can be married off to Shelach. Instead of being sent back to her father's home, she, she has no status whatsoever. Um, and in process, uh, in process of time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died, and Judah was comforted and went up and, uh, unto his sheep shearers to Timnah, he and his friend here of the Adolamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnah to shear his sheep. Now what does she do? This is worth looking at carefully. And she put off from her the garments of her widowhood, and covered herself with her veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in the entrance of Enaim, Enaim, right, sight, which is by the way to Timnah, for she saw that Shelah was grown up, and she was not given unto him to wife. In other words, Judah was not keeping, not going by the law, which was the moment that Shelah was old enough to be betrothed to Tamar, that should have happened. And Judah hasn't done it, right? In case, right, the Shelah also dies. So she has been done a gross injustice, right? and what does she do? What, what does she actually do? She takes off the widow's garments, she covers herself with a veil, she wraps herself, and she just sits by the roadside on the way, right, the, the, where he's bound to pass, a kind of cross, crossway, right? a crossroad. Now, does she actively disguise herself? Unclear. Right? She, it, she conceals her true identity. Okay? She conceals her identity. She doesn't pretend to be somebody else. She just doesn't look like Tamar. Right? It's uh, just a woman sitting by the roadside, right? And when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a, a harlot. He thought her to be a harlot, right? Again, Jacob, think, uh, uh, Isaac thinks Jacob is Esau, right? Except that there, there was a deliberate disguise, right? Here there isn't. There isn't the adopting of another identity. There's the hiding of one identity. And then Judah, you know, is so, so eager, right? he thinks her to be a harlot. And he turned unto her, by the way, and said, Come, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me that thou mayst come unto me? And he said, I will send thee a kid of the goats from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? Now, 
Tamas already experienced Yehuda's dishonesty, right? He already hasn't kept a far more sacred pledge, which was giving her his son in marriage, right? with, to which he was bound. Uh, and he said, what pledge shall I give thee? And she said, thy signet and thy cord and thy staff that is in thy hand, right? In other words, every, as uh, Robert Alter says, it's like asking for all your credit cards, right? <laughs> every single one, right? All the, all the indicators of your identity and your status. And he is so eager, right? He is so impelled by lust that he gives her everything. He doesn't say, wait a minute, perhaps, uh, you know, perhaps we'll make do with the signet, okay? No. He gives her everything, and he gave them to her, and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. Right? Now, notice her resourcefulness. She's taking a risk. Right? She doesn't know what's going to happen. She doesn't know that she's going to become pregnant, and she doesn't know what she's going to do if and when she becomes pregnant. And she arose and went away and put off her veil from her, and put on the garments of her widowhood. In other words, she resumes her former identity, which is that of a widow. And Yuda does fulfill the promise. And Yuda sent the kid of the goats by the hand of his friend the Adonite to receive the pledge from the woman's hand. But he found her not. Then he asked the men of her place, saying, Where is the harlot that was at Enaim by the wayside? And they said, there has been no harlot here, which is absolutely true. Right? And he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. And also the men of the place said, there has been no harlot here. And Judah said, well, let her take it, lest we be put to shame. You know, I mean, what am I going to do? I gave someone all these pledges and she's taken them, you know, just in order to, to have sex with her. Okay. Um, and then, uh, uh, and, uh, and it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. Right? And moreover, behold, she is with child by harlotry, which is, as it were, right, ironic, because he did think that she was a harlot. Okay? And Judah said, bring her forth and let her be burnt which is a very harsh judgment because normally the punishment is skila, stoning. To be burnt is a very, I mean, it just hardly exists in, in Jewish law. We don't learn of it at all, right? When she was brought forth, she said to her father-in-law, saying, by the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these, the signet and the cords and the staff. And Yehuda acknowledged them and said, She is more righteous than I, for as much as I gave her not to Shelah, my son. Right. Okay. I did her a wrong, and she is more righteous when she makes it a sort of comparison but he hasn't been righteous at all so uh, but notice she does this privately she doesn't shame him in public she sends to him right, and says here it is here's the evidence right? and he knew her again no more very discreet and it came to pass in time of her travel that, behold, twins were in her womb. And so, right, okay, and then what happens is that, uh, of course, as a result, uh, we get Peretz, who is the forefather, ultimately, of David and ultimately, ultimately, of the Mashiach. Now, notice that just as Tamar gains nothing, nor does, uh, nor does um, I mean, the first Tamar, Amnon's Tamar, nor does Judas Tamar. He doesn't marry her to Shela. She hasn't actually achieved anything. All she's done is save herself, I mean, on the, at the time, is save herself from a harsh judgment. 
right, from being contemned as a harlot. Right? And she gives birth to twins, right? But she hasn't been restored to the household. She hasn't been given a husband. She's still, as it were, you know, the equivalent would be stateless, right? without a clear identity and still without property. So just as Tamar gains nothing from this murder of the man who raped her, Judas Tamar also ultimately gains herself nothing. But yes. She have been, uh, uh, her objection, her object of it was to renew the genes of. Yes, Jesus. of course, so by Judah. Did. Yes, but, by so Judah. She did, in right. Fact. Yeah, that's true. But at, at that particular point, she has not. I mean, he doesn't acknowledge that he's the father, right? No. No. But we know later. Yes. But here, when when she shows when the father-in-law has impregnated her. She yes. Has, she has performed, she made sure oh, that yes. her brother's right. who so died the seed has killed. Has yes, that's true. That's true. So but the public know. doesn't know this. But they also, know it. Oh, you know it. Okay. She, she we, ties, the reader, know. She ties the red thread so they'll know which of them was first because that's a question that's the one of, who's inheritance. of inheritance. Yes. I would say, suggest maybe she does gain something else. And that is the rejection of the status of widowhood. Even though she puts on the clothes again, she basically doesn't want to be without. And she's claimed her so, own. Yeah, and there's, there's another. She has a status which she lacked before. Yes, that's perfectly true. Okay, right. So uh, what we have here is a woman wronged, right? Yes, go ahead. Two things. One, there's this parallel between the two stories. Because in both cases, the woman is who's, who is sent back to the top to live in the household of a male relative. The woman who seems to have no status. And in the first of Tamara's case, because she was raped. In the second case, because she's a widow. And the second thing is that the part of the woman was, as I what I read, is that the next in line to marry her was, uh, was um, Judah. And he could have just released, and he was legally like, engaged to her. Uh, you know, and he could have either released her, or he could have married her. But he didn't either. He just let her sit around in her father's house. And so, in a sense, he's, when he's saying she's more righteous than I, he's also referring to his lack of action. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, that's very quickly. We do have some time left, haven't we? I think, yes, okay, I think we have about 20 minutes left. All right, let's, yes, okay, let, let's just do this in an orderly fashion, right? Let's first of all think, what are the similarities between the two stories? In other words, what, what do they have in common, right? The fact that women aren't considered very important people there to be used. Yeah, that's one thing. And the man, if you want to look at it, yeah, so he made a mistake, so what? Mm -hmm. but, so uh, what, when in one yeah. case he's yeah. murdered, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. There must be, in other cases as well, where eventually revenge comes in. But sometimes not. Many times not. No. Right, right. But let's begin. Right? In both cases, there are the women are victims of male relatives. Yes, that's right. Not some outer force, right? No, no. Okay, male relatives. Both women live in patriarchal societies that have laws and conventions which determine the respective status of the sexes. And the status of the women is inferior to the status of the men. Right? Oh, yes. it, yeah, okay, well, you, we say, oh, yes, right? It still is in many respects, yes. okay? I mean, it's uh, uh, according to Jewish law, certainly, mm -hmm. and in many, in many other respects. You hear yeah. so often, no. boy, a Kaddish, I should have a Kaddish. Yes, quite right. Um, 
Both societies are ruled by laws and conventions regarding what is lawful and just. Right? When Tamar says to Amnon, this should not be done in Israel, this just isn't what we do, right? You're doing a, you're breaking the law, you're breaking the convention, right? And the same, of course, is true of Yehuda. The, the law is, right, the mitzvah is that you give the widow to the next in line of your sons, right? Or you release her through Leverite marriage when the son comes of age, right? There are two possibilities, right? Either you marry her to him when he's of age or you can release her, right? And he does neither, okay? No, he, he makes her into he, the guilty one. She waits and that, that's it, right? He makes her into the guilty one, the bad one. Right, okay. In both societies, women are dependent on the men for their own fate, for their physical and social, uh, their social status, for their physical well-being. In other words, uh, although, uh, although ultimately, and we'll see in a moment, the difference is that Tamar does something about it. Tamar, Yehuda's Tamar, I should keep mentioning who's Tamar, I mean, right? But in both cases, the offender is a relative of the victim. It's not some outsider. And in both cases, it's a person. Oh, why did I think I had 15 minutes left? To 11.35. Could we? So how much have I got still? About seven. Okay. Ooh. Okay. Um, all right, let's quickly, 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 quickly. Um, okay, well, the trickery I've already mentioned, the fact that clothing is very central in both stories. Tamar's torn garment, David's tearing his garments, right? Tamar's veil in the Genesis story. Um, the passage of time before the settling of accounts, right? Nothing happens immediately. Uh, time goes by between, I mean, time enough for Shelach to grow up, right? however long that is. We don't know how old he is when, uh, when, his, uh, when his older brother dies. Right? But time goes by. And there, there, I'm sure you can think of other resemblances. But the difference are very the differences are perhaps more telling. In one case we have a young, innocent virgin, right? Tamar, who doesn't have a clue of what's going to happen and appeals, you know, in this innocent way to Amnon and gives all the reasons why he shouldn't rape her, right? Um, sort of in an almost logical way, right? Uh, you, this, is, this isn't the sort of thing you should do and think of me and think of yourself, right? In uh, the case of Judah's uh, Tamar, right, you've got a twice married widow. This is a mature woman who thinks, care, who does something. She doesn't know what the result is going to be, but there is a plan here. She does something which may, which may work. I mean, does she... Perhaps she knows Yehuda well enough that if he sees a woman sitting alone there on the wayside after his wife's died, right, he may want to, as he says, come in unto her, right? So she sits there, nire maie, you know, that sort of thing. And then when it happens, she knows how to, the, the, uh, the quick-wittedness, right, with which she demands all these pledges, leaving him really helpless and having all the power in her, in her hands, right? <laughs> the, other na the other difference, of course, is in the nature of the crime against the woman. There's a physical rape and then a rejection. Um, versus the denial of legal rights and the ousting from the family. Not quite the same thing. Right? 
Then the other difference, the victim's responses to injury and injustice, Tamar's helplessness, the public outcry, her reliance on Absalom's uh, assurances uh, as compared or contrasted with the resourcefulness, the enterprise of uh, Genesis Tamar, right, who takes a very great risk. I mean, she's about to be put to death. Right? She's taking an enormous risk. Okay. The use of disguise in both stories, Amna or disguise or dissembling, Amnon's pretending to be sick, right? Absalom's uh, wily bringing of Amnon uh, to the uh, sheep shearing, Tamas use of the widow's garb, the veiling of the face, or I'll take taking off her widow's garb, veiling her face, so on. Um, the question of what, what they gain, I mean, I'm, you're right, she, I mean, that there is ultimately an heir that's right, if, which she couldn't get via the, the three sons of Yehuda, is a gain, whereas the other Tamar really gains nothing. But what eventually happens to her? You never hear no, what happens never hear. to her. It's not important, right? Yes, That's also... Not, no, it's not important. I mean, it's not important to the narrative. It's not important to the narrator. We don't hear... We hardly hear about daughters, right? Dina, as Ruthie pointed out, yes, one of the, And what happens to Dina is a, is a terrible... It's a terrible, terrible story, right? Someone loves her, somebody wants to marry her, she wants to marry him, but no, you know, it goes counter to the family's honor. So the, not only do her brothers kill him, they slaughter off the whole tribe. Right? The bloodthirstiness, the desire for revenge is very similar also to Absalom's, you know, the, where the king thinks, right? that all the sons have been killed, that this even seems a, a possibility to anybody, the kind of ruthlessness. Right? So if I think of, if we think of anything, if we see any, any contemporary reflections which might emerge from these stories, right? It, I think we still today see a widespread prevalence of victimization of women. Oh, yes. right? Look at the statistics. Oh, yes. Murder, violence, rape, trafficking, the denial of rights, exploitation of various kinds that I mentioned in my lower introduction. Pay. Lower pay, yes, economic uh, exploitation, physical exploitation, psychological exploitation, everything. And women's status still remains inferior. Despite it, this is the interesting thing. We have improved legislation. We've always had a certain degree of excellent protective legislation, right? I mean, from the, if you like, the, the Gilat Smawut, which speaks of the equality of all citizens, irrespective of race, religion, or sex. Well, we know that that's uh, an ideal. We ha don't have any of those in this country. But at least there was that ideal. And there was a lot, there's been a lot of legislation which actually um, stipulates equality, right? But uh, in practice, we don't have it. And we see, as I said before, we see women doing exactly the same work as, uh, uh, as men and yet uh, earning less. Right? Uh, the only place where I think we have seen really there has been improvement, right? Um, there have been certain laws, certain regulations, uh, the shelters for uh, uh, battered women now. It's possible for the police to remove a violent uh, man from the household uh, and prevent him from coming anywhere within a certain distance of the household, right? But the crimes continue, particularly the honor killings, right? Which is a horrendous thing. She did, did something wrong, particularly in the Arab and Bedouin communities, right? A horrendous case in Haifa about uh, oh, eight, eight years or so ago, where a, a young woman was seen by her brother talking to a man on the doorstep of her house, right? 
and the man was not a member of the family and he killed her he killed his sister right? and another sister saw this happening and mentioned it to a third sister so he killed the second and the third and the fourth sister witnessed this and realizing that she was in danger she ran away from home nobody knows I mean somebody must know where she is but he wasn't able to find her so she's still alive somewhere but this you know the, the slightest uh, taint on the honor of the family which justifies murdering and that's not considered a stain on the family honor right? uh, that this still exists in what we consider a modern civilized society and that very often the police don't step in because they say well these are the social customs of this particular community and we don't we don't want to interfere right so what as I said in my I'm finishing with this I think what is a major change I see is really in the respond, women's responses and court responses. I just want to cite one final case, which I happen to be very much involved with through being, the, uh, at the time of uh, my being the chairwoman of the Israel Women's Network. In 1988, a young woman was gang raped by fellow youngsters at Kibbutz Shomrat. It took her some years before a great deal of encouragement from one of her friends to report the matter to the police. And the initial hearing of these young men was in the Haifa District Court in 1992. In other words, four years elapsed before they were brought to trial. Okay? And they were acquitted. Why did the judge acquit them? Because he said, if so much time went by before she reported the case, it can't really have affected her very, very adversely, oh, right? Okay, yes, yes. no, right. So he did, and he also said, actually, there's, uh, this case is of no public interest, right? So uh, we. Uh, so we went to see, we meaning uh, delegates from the Israel Women's Network, we had the good luck that uh, Dorit Banish was then the state prosecutor, uh, and we went to see her, and we said, look, this just ignores the psychology of rape. Uh, women don't rush to report rape. They're ashamed of having been raped. And, I remember she, and she understood, although the psychology of rape was not yet well, well known or well understood, but she understood and she took the case up again and the young men were sentenced, right? But it took, the final verdict was in 1993, right? Uh, so if there hadn't been intervention, if there hadn't been awareness on, and action on the part of a group of women, if we hadn't had the good fortune to talk to a woman who had a degree of power, and I must mention where we really see women in power and, and uh, in very important positions is in the legal system. We now have a large number of women judges, right? We've had a woman heading the high court, which uh, at first she was denied. You know, people for the first time said perhaps it shouldn't be automatic, you know. But it really, really works. And women still prefer not to lodge complaints. We've been brainwashed into thinking women have been brainwashed into thinking that they were to blame you know they didn't dress accordingly they behaved in a provocative manner right and so on so they're afraid of coming out but as i said before right the fact that a woman like a was it a oh she was a came out against katsa this gives other women courage and we saw how that one case suddenly produced a whole crop of complaints against other men in power, up. right? And they're still coming up. And ty it takes time, it takes time. And the question, of course, is always this, you know, the response. 
well, not in the Katsav case, because that really was rape, but, well, uh, the joke, you know, what are you allowed to, well, I can't even say she looks pretty today, or I can't just put my arm around her in a casual manner, right? Well, you can't if she doesn't want you to, right? But then again, that means, yes, you as a woman have to make it clear that I don't want you to put your arm around me, right? I don't want it. I remember, <laughs> I remember so well, and when see, we see it all the time. Um, at one point, I was in a committee that the Sinat Ken Rashid, uh, Amira Dotan, a very beautiful woman, set up to help her improve the status of women in the army, which she did very successfully. And we went sort of from one head of a unit to another. And wherever we went, as we came in, whoever it was, the commanding officer, would kiss Amira and would kiss her when we left, right? And I felt like saying, tell me, do you do this every time some commanding officer comes? Do you do it to your male colleagues as well? <laughs> well, of course they don't, you know? Or do you watch the, watch the Israel Prize ceremony? A woman comes up to get the prize and immediately all the men kiss her, right? Okay, they don't kiss the other men, only in one case where it's a sort of older man that they greatly respect. So. Look out for these things and either say, okay, you kiss the woman, but please kiss the man as well. <laughs> okay. Or seize the opportunity yourself, you know. <laughs> the other way of being equal, right? <laughs> or just a threat.